Right, let's hope the sound's working all right this time. I'm going to talk about the uh, next element in the question bank, which is capacitors, inductance and resonance, three things that go together quite closely as you'll see. We'll start with capacitors first. Now transformers are actually included in this particular element of the question bank, but I want to cover them under power supplies, which comes later. They, uh, they sit much better with that. Uh, rather than this particular area. And I think this is enough on its own without drawing transformers in. So we'll just cover capacitors first. Capacitors are an uh, electrical component like resistors that are used in enormous numbers in circuitry. You see them all over the place and um, without them we'd be, we'd be stuck. They form uh, quite a few important functions, but the main ones are we use them as devices to couple signals between circuits. We also use them to decouple or bypass. We'll show you examples of that later with a practical piece of equipment. In other words, to stop signals, uh, alternating current signals, radio signals getting into and, and out of things where they shouldn't, where they don't belong. And um, we also use them in, in power supplies as well for smoothing or filtering in, in the power supply. Another vital application we use them for is in tuned circuits. Uh, to uh, in tuned circuits and um, radio frequency filters and things like that. They form a, and they interact with with inductors. To, to perform vital functions there and, and all elements of radio they crop up all over the place. Now basically a capacitor is a device that can store an electrical charge and all its properties come from, from that basic thing. The basic capacitor is a couple of conductive plates separated by some sort of insulating material. So you might draw a plate like this, so three-dimensionally and there's another one underneath it here. In the side view you'd see something looking like that. And there's some sort of insulating material between them and a connection to either side of it. And the basic radio training manual shows this um, page 15. Uh, capacitors and DC and AC circuits under that chapter. And coincidentally, because the capacitor looks like that, that's what its symbol looks like, very much like what we've drawn down the end there. The basic capacitor looks like that. Some are adjustable, like resistors. And we'll show some examples of them later. So they have an arrow through them. Some are adjusted with a screwdriver, and then they have a sort of flattened off arrow. Same as variable resistors. They've got an arrow through them, or ones that are adjusted with a capacitor or like uh, with a screwdriver like that, or some other tool, that's sort of set in vaquette type thing. Some capacitors have to be installed in a circuit the right way around. We'll come on to them, they're called electrolytic capacitors, and they'll have a little plus symbol that they have to be installed with that side going to the positive end in a circuit, and the other side, the minus is not normally marked. Occasionally you'll see them drawn like that, the, the ones that have to be around the right way in a circuit where it's one side is, is not blacked out, the other is, and the, the blacked out side is a minus terminal and that's a plus, but they'll generally have a plus symbol there as well. So that's the symbols. So that's what a capacitor looks like, it's a sheet of conduct two conductive sheets or two conductors of some sort separated by an insulating material. Now the insulating material in the, in the middle has got a particular name and it's called a dielectric. And generally it's actually the type of dielectric in there that gives the capacitor its name. So that um, dielectric could be air. So we talk about an air capacitor, or an air variable capacitor commonly. It could be uh, mica, there's another material that's used, it's a, a non-conducting insulating mineral. Not used, well you can still get them, getting a bit expensive, but there are other capacitors you can use. Some use polystyrene. Uh, various forms of plastics, there's a whole lot of them, polypropylene and, um, and so on. Uh, ceramic is one of the more common ones. And then there's things called electrolytic 
I won't write that up, that uses a, a special, sort of like a, 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 a paste material. So we'll come on to those in a bit more detail later, but just to say that the, there's all different types of insulating materials that are used um, to separate the, um, the two, two plates. Now, what does a capacitor do? And I think we'll just illustrate, we'll show a practical example in a minute with connecting a, a battery up to a power supply um, through, a, through a light bulb, but we'll just draw a circuit of that first. So imagine if we've got a battery. Use a light bulb or a resistor, something just to control the current flow into the capacitor. Now, if we imagine, we can draw a switch. That's a symbol for a switch. When we, um, when we close the switch, what happens is the electrons will flow into the circuit, so we'll just draw the switch closed. What happens is, now you might think nothing will happen because we've got an insulator, we've got a break in the circuit. Well it's not quite right because the capacitor is able to be charged up. It's not the same as a battery being charged. A car battery being charged is a chemical reaction taking place and storing electricity. This is just electrons moving onto the plates. Now what happens is a battery of course has got a surplus of electrons on the minus terminal and a, a lack of them on the plus. So the electrons can move through the bowl and what can happen is they can build up, well not can, they do, electrons will build up on one side of the capacitor and this side is attracting electrons, the plus side um, you know opposites attract. The electrons that are free to move, remember it's a, a conducting material, usually a metal, the electrons um, are able to move out of the capacitor and you're left with a, a lack of electrons which makes a positive charge on that side of the battery. And that's a good time. Right, sorry about that, doing a quick camera check. I've had a few problems with sound and things and uh, I'm not actually teaching a class at the moment, the room's empty. I've had to come back because the class I took last night there was a sound failure. I can't be begin to explain to you how frustrating <laughs> it was. So here we are, we've, we've charged up the capacitor. And what can actually happen if the capacitor is big enough, if it's got plates that are large enough, we'll talk about capacitance and measuring it in the middle in a minute, is enough current will flow initially to charge up the capacitor, the bulb will light for a little while and then go out as it charges up. We could actually draw a little graph showing how, how that, um, how that uh, battery, how that capacitor actually, sorry, how the capacitor charges up. <coughs> Pardon me. So we've got time running along here and that point here is when the switch is closed. What happens initially is current will flow into the battery, into the capacitor through the bulb and as it charges up, it falls off down to, to nothing over, to, over, over a period of time. The reason it falls off is because as more and more electrons arrive on the plates, they're tending to repel the ones that wanting to come in. Remember, like, uh, likes repel, opposites attract. So the last few electrons to arrive take a little longer because they're having to go in against the charge, against the capacity, the electrons are already there. So it starts off at a high rate of current, then it slows down to next to nothing. It's an interesting fact that it never, current never quite drops to nothing. There's always the, there's never the last electron to arrive. It's a bit like the story of the frog jumping halfway to the well each day and how, how long does it take him to get there? Well, he never gets there because you're always halving a distance, a bit like that. If we measure the voltage, so that's current, we'll call that I, that curve there. If we actually measure the voltage across the capacitor, what happens is the voltage starts at nothing when you close the switch and it builds up and up and up and up and up, it's sort of an opposite shape to the current curve. So as, as the, the capacitor reaches full charge, the voltage across the capacitor equals the voltage across the battery and it reaches, it reaches a peak. And you can actually calculate if you know the capacitance, the value of the capacitor and how much resistance the bulb, how long those curves take to get to various levels. We don't need to know that to that much detail for the exam, but that's called time constants if you want to read about that, and that's useful for timing circuits and things like that. So that's how voltage 
and current behaves when a capacitor is being charged up, hooked onto a, onto a supply. So I'll just rub that off. What about discharging it? Well the opposite will happen. If you um, now have this charged capacitor, and we'll do a demonstration in a minute, and a switch, and a light bulb. When you close the switch, the electrons on this side of the capacitor will now want to go around the circuit to the other side. They're attracted by the positive charge on the other side. There's an imbalance across there and it wants to get back to, back to how it was it started. So what happens is you close the switch, you get a flow of electrons around the circuit until the charge is all gone and it's equal both sides. So the bulb will light for a little bit and then go out. So now we can draw, you can actually draw, and we can actually um, just draw a graph of how the voltage behaves across the capacitor. That's time and that's zero, time progressing along there. When you close the switch, so just before you um, close the switch, the capacitor is fully charged up to a certain voltage, whatever the battery voltage was. Close the switch, the battery discharges down to nothing. So when you're discharging it, the voltage behaves in the other way. Remember when we're charging, the voltage is gradually built up. When you're discharging it, it's the opposite. It starts at the battery voltage, what the battery voltage was that you charged it with, goes down to nothing. So that's the capacitor being charged and discharged. Now you might ask, well, how bright is the bulb going to light, or how long is it going to light for? How much charge will it store? So how long will the, the bulb light up when you um, connect it to the charged capacitor? That depends on how big, how big the ca ca capacitor is. And um, when we mean big, we mean its measurement of uh, capacitance. Remember the measurement of resistance is ohms. The measurement of capacitance is, we'll rub out dielectric, is farads. And we'll just come on to that in just one moment, just to define what a farad is, but that's the measurement of it. How big a capacitor is depends on three things. It depends upon, remember we drew the plates before? And the basic radio training manual talks about this on, um, on page 15 and 16. But it, the first thing is the area of the plates. The bigger the plates are, as opposed to say capacitor with a smaller set of plates each side, it's common sense really. The larger the, uh, the area of the plates, the more electrons you can fit on there. So um, that gives you, uh, an, 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 uh, so the larger the area of the plates, the larger the capacitance. So it's in direct proportion. As one goes up, the other goes up with it. The other thing that, um, the, the second thing that affects uh, how much capacitance um, a capacitor is, is the gap between the plates. We draw that in the side, sorry there's a fly in the room but we're just going to put up with that. The distance between the plates. The further apart the plates are, the lower the capacitance, the closer they are the higher it is. So it's inverse proportion to the, to the distance between them. The larger the distance, the smaller capacitance, as opposed to area which is direct proportion. The larger the area, the larger the capacitance. And the third thing that influences how much capacitance is what the dielectric is made out of in between here. And we talked about that before. Depending upon if it's, uh, just make it a little bit bigger to see, but easier. The lowest capacitance, the lowest, the, the material, the dielectric that will give you the lowest capacitance is a vacuum. And you can actually get vacuum variable capacitors um, in, in a glass envelope. They put them in a vacuum to help stop them sparking over for very high voltages and transmitters and aerial tuning units, trans, transmatches for uh, high powered transmitters. 
if you um, put air in there, you get a little bit more capacitance, not a lot, but you can increase the capacitance an awful amount by putting other material in between them. You know, plastics, ceramics, all those other materials I was talking about before. By putting um, different dielectric materials in there, or putting a dielectric of some form in between the plates, the capacitance goes up. So that's just a, a useful thing to remember. You can draw that as a as um, capacitance. As the symbol means proportional. It means not directly equal to, but proportional. In other words, the way things change. The area of the plates times the, um, the dielectric um, constant. We'll just put dielectric constant, the DC. There's, there's, there is a proper abbreviation for it. We won't use it here. We don't need to go into this depth for the exam, but just to give you an idea. And inversely proportional to the distance between the plates. The larger the area, the greater the dielectric trans constant. So that's something that relates to what the type of material that's between the plates. Uh, air, vacuum having a very low dielectric constant. Uh, plastic materials having a very high one. So the bigger those two, the bigger the capacitance, and the bigger the area between them, because it's been the answer, you know, the answer is equal to those divided by that, the bigger the distance between, the lower the capacitance. The larger the capacitance, the longer the bulb will light when we hook it up a charged battery. Now, what was the next thing? Farads. A farad, remember when we talked in current, just to let you know what a farad is, you don't have to know this for the exam, but it's just useful if you think, well, what on earth is one farad? One farad is, a capacitor of one farad means that when you connect a battery, a supply, with a voltage of one volt, a one volt supply across a one farad capacitor, the number of electrons that will build up when it's fully charged is one coulomb. And what is a coulomb? Remember a coulomb was that number of electrons that flows in a circuit per second to give one amp. So a current flowing in a circuit of one amp is, um, is one coulomb per second. So, uh, and uh, that's an incredibly large number. What it was about 6 by 10 to the 23 or 20, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's an enormous number. But that's what a farad is. It's a capacitor that when you connect a one volt battery to it, that's how many electrons build up. The, the increase, just, just, to mean, just as an aside, the higher the battery voltage, the more electrons can be pushed on by the battery. The, the, gruntier, the higher the voltage of the battery, in other words, the, 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 the more excess of electrons on the negative terminal, the more, um, sorry about that, the more uh, electrons will be stored. But that's where a farad comes from. You don't, as I said, don't have to know that for the exam, but just say it does actually have a, a meaning. Like all these units, they all can be defined back to uh, something. Now one farad is very, very large. Most capacitors we deal with in radio are, are much smaller than a farad. Unlike ohms, if ohms, a one ohm resistor is actually quite small. We deal with hundreds, tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of ohms. Capacitance is the opposite. We deal with very small numbers. Typical capacitors that might be used in radio range from only a few, um, you know, maybe a 2.7 picofarad capacitor. That's 2.7 times 10 to the minus 12 farads. It should be a big F, shouldn't it? Yeah. PF is a symbol, PICO for minus 12. So that's, uh, that's a very, very small number, but that's a very common capacitor size, 2.7, maybe 10, you know, 10, 100, 1,000 picofarads. Right up to um, capac large capacitors, which I'll show you in a minute, that we use in power supplies for smoothing and filtering. It might be 10,000 microfarads. Uh, maybe even up to 100,000 microfarads, so very, very big, so many, 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 <laughs> you know, many, many zeros times bigger than um, the, the 2.7 picofarad model. What, one, one, just one convention is uh, generally in, in radio you'd go to, like if we're talking about frequencies, if we talked about 10,000 10, hertz, 10 kilohertz, um, and then we go up to, um, um, it, 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 no, hang on, I'll just, just explain that again without stopping the camera, is rather than going to 10, 10 millifarads would make sense, wouldn't it? 10,000 microfarads equals 10 millifarads. 100,000 microfarads equals 10 millifarads. 
We're a bit slack in radio, but for some reason the convention is we just stick to microfarads. We very we occasionally a very large capacity like 100,000 might be called 0.1 farad, but you'll generally see that labelled on the side. Rather than going to millifarads, MF, they just stick with the micro, the mu symbol. Uh, you do get very large, even one, two farad capacitors. They can be quite small actually, they've got very cleverly built inside, and they're often used in computers as backup, uh, memory backup supplies, and the other place you see them is in uh, those little wind up radios that you can give a crank and they um, charge a, use a generator to charge up a capacitor and then ra run the radio for five, ten minutes or so. Um, they don't have many applications outside that. They're no, although they're a very big capacitor, they're no good in power supply filtering because they can't actually handle big currents flowing into them. They're fine for a few tens or maybe 50 milliamps small amounts of current to supply a, a, a little radio, but they can't handle power supply filtering, which we'll talk about in the power supplies, where you might have many tens of amps flowing in and out of the things. So they have a very particular application. Righty ho. What I'll do is I'll just demonstrate the um, capacitor being charged and discharged. Now we'll talk about some. Right, what we have here is our trusty power supply for supplying um, a current, a light bulb, which we've seen before, and a fairly large electrolytic capacitor. This one's a bit of a monster. This one's a 310,000 microfarads. It came out of an old part of an old um, computer power supply that was ratted. It's, there's no charge in it. If we uh, connect the light bulb here across its terminals, nothing happens. This is actually a, uh, one of those polarized ones, but it's got a plus. There's a little, you won't be able to see it, there's a little plus symbol here on top to show you which way around to connect it into a circuit. So now we've got a supply here, we've got it connected up to charge. So here we go, we'll just connect it up. There you go. It lit up for a while and then it faded out as the capacitor fully charged. There's no now no more there's no significant number of electrons going on to this capacitor plates anymore. Now what we can do is just put the bulb directly across the capacitor. There you go. Lit up, faded out as the electrons rush from one side back to the other. Do again, charge it up. Discharge it. This one's got a few black marks on it from obviously someone shorted the thing out at some stage. If you get a screwdriver and put it across there you get a huge current flowing for a split second and actually cause a spark. Not recommended, it's not very good for the capacitor. They're not designed to handle that sort of thing. So there you are, that's a capacitor. Just to show you what we're talking about it isn't science fiction. They actually do charge up and discharge. Right, before we move on to reactants and different types of capacitors, we'll just quickly cover capacitors in series and parallel. Like resistors, um, you can connect capacitors in, into circuits in series and parallel, and they'll give you different amounts of capacitance. They behave in an opposite way to resistors, and I'll, I'll, and I'll show you why. Um, but there are cases where we definitely hook capacitors in parallel and series, more often in parallel. When we um, and, smoothing and filtering capacitors and power supplies. We often connect a large number of big ones in series, and sorry, in parallel. Sometimes we put them in series in radio frequency circuits and things like that, often to get the value of capacitance that we actually want. So just quickly, just show you capacitors in parallel. We won't go into the maths in as much detail as we did with resistors. So there's the first capacitor, we'll call C1, second one C2. Two capacitors in parallel, just like resistors in parallel. Remember with resistors in parallel you end up with a resistance that's lower than, than each one because the current can flow through both and it's easier so the resistance is lower. When we put capacitance in parallel we actually end up with larger capacitance and you can see why. Uh, it's pretty straight, pretty obvious really that you've, it's like adding the plate area of this one onto the plate area of that one, so effectively just having more plates. Remember that the more area of plates, the bigger the capacitance. So when we have capacitors in parallel, so capacitors in parallel, we add them up. C total, total capacitance there is equal to C1 
plus C2 and so on and so forth, there's three or four or five, and just add them up. So if we have a 10 microfarad capacitor and put, say parallel with a 33 microfarad capacitor, the total will be 43 microfarads. Add them up. Just remember it's opposite to resistors, but you can see why, because we're increasing the area of the plates, increases the capacitance. We can also connect them in series, and then an interesting thing happens. So we've got uh, two capacitors, C1 and C2, in series. Now, when we connect resistors in series, we increase the resistance. The current has to go through one resistor, then through the second one. There's more resistance, we add them up. Resistors in series, we add them. Capacitors in series is the opposite. It behaves like resistors in parallel, we actually get less capacitance. And you can see why, if you think about it, on these sort of terms here, we've got one capacitor, two capacitor. So we've got one set of plates, a second plate of plates connected with a con conductor to the second set there. And it's almost a bit like, you can imagine we've got one capacitor and we've moved the plates further apart. We've now got two gaps, two light dielectric gaps, and double the dielectric gap if you like, uh, if they're the same value capacitance. As so, so capacitance in series, we get less. The capacitance is lower than each individual one. And it's the same formula for resistors. One over capacitance in series, one over C total, is equal to one over C1 plus one over C2. Now we won't redo the maths. You're not expected to for the exam questions. We'll come on to them later. They don't, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, and I'll just double check that to make sure I'm not t talking science fiction. They give you some nice easy problems. Now, remember if you put um, two resistors in parallel of equal value, the resistance is halved. Well, it's the same with capacitors in series. So if this one's a 10 microfarad capacitor, that one's a 10 microfarad capacitor, then it's half. 5 microfarads. If you do that formula I just showed you before, you'll get the answer 5 microfarads. If it's 100 microfarads and 100, the answer is 50, it's halved. So, and that's the exam questions. They'll tell you, they'll ask you, say, two capacitors of 20 microfarads to put in series, what's the, uh, the total? And um, I'll just find a, a, uh, an example here. 315, uh, we'll talk about um, the first one's capacitors in parallel. 315 picofarad capacitors are wired in parallel. The value of the total is, forgive my drawing, it's getting a bit untidy. I'm getting near my tea break. 15, 15, 15 picofarads. You add them up. Now they're all in picofarads, so you can just add them up and the answer will be in picofarads. If one was a micro, you'd have to convert them to all being the same units. So 15 plus 15 plus 15 is equal to 45 picofarads. And that question, which is question 6, the answer is A, 45 picofarads, so all the other ones are going to be wrong. Just a quick thing about um, multi-choice questions. I'll talk about this in the introduction session, so I might be repeating myself here, but um, generally with multiple choice will be one answer that's pretty dumb and then two that are sort of okay and one that's right. <laughs> Sometimes it pays to spot the silly one and eliminate it. But generally these questions aren't too bad. They're not trying to trick you up. So that's a, an exam question. Capacitors in, in parallel. I'll just find one for capacitors in series. And there isn't one. So that makes it nice and simple, doesn't it? There's one here, two metal plates separated by air form a 0.001 microfarad capacitor. And it asks, how can you increase its capacitance or change it to 0.002? How much, so if the two plates are separated by air, well to increase the capacitance you can increase the area of the plates. Well that's a bit difficult to do but you can change the gap. Remember, it's inverse proportion. To increase the capacitance, you decrease the gap, so you move the plates closer together. So 
the answers here are A, bringing the metal plates closer together, B, moving the plates, making the plates smaller in size, well that won't work, it'll make capacitance smaller. Moving the plates apart, well that will make it smaller. Uh, or D, touching the two plates together, that's a dumb question, dumb answer, no you wouldn't do that. <laughs> the answer is A, bringing the metal plates together or closer together. So that capacitors in series per and parallel, they behave opposite to resistors but you use the same formulae in the opposite situation. Right, next thing I want to talk about is reactants, nearly finished capacitors. We'll talk about reactants and then we'll talk about um, particular types of capacitors. I'll just check the video. Reactants is all about how capacitors behave in alternating current circuits. That's where capacitors start to get interesting, where they do the things most of the time that we're really interested in, in electronics and radio, in a dynamic situation, in a changing situation, we've got varying voltages applied to the capacitor. Um, so just as we move on to reactants, we'll just imagine what happens if we connect our light bulb to the capacitor, uh, a light bulb and capacitor to a, an, an, an AC supply. Remember we, an AC we talked about that little symbol being a, a, a symbol for an AC generator of some sort. So we have our light bulb. Now note we can't do this kind of experiment with that big capacitor. Anything that's got a plus symbol on it we wouldn't want to hook it up to an AC supply. No, the capacitor's not designed to do that. Uh, we'd have to use a capacitor which are all their remaining types which are um, non-polarised. In other words they don't have a way around you put them into a circuit. When we talk about capacitor types, I'll go into that in more detail. So, now remember an AC supply, as time goes along, plus, minus, make it a bit bigger, plus one moment, half cycle, negative, plus, 